Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I am exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team, the better half, if you ask me. I'm Bob, and today we're having a frequent guest. Uh, this is her third appearance on our podcast. Her first two were so popular that uh, by demand, we're actually going to cover questions that she's been getting from her fans, uh, basically, and uh, really good stuff on osteoporosis. She, I'm going to just summarize by saying she is the person re with regard to uh, expertise in osteoporosis as far as exercises. She's been doing this since 19, 1984. She's been a physical therapist since 1962. So, you know, almost 60 years of experience. So pretty crazy. Uh, but she, you'll find out that she knows everything that you need to know about osteoporosis from an exercise standpoint. Please welcome Sarah Meeks. Welcome back to the program, Sarah Meeks. Third time. Well, well thank you. It's um, uh, This is my third time talking to you. And it's always such a pleasure. And Likewise. Um, Likewise. And I'm hoping that the information that I have today, it's a little bit of different format than the first two. You're going to make statements and I'm going to comment on that. And then we'll have a conversation if it comes up. Sure. I'd just like to tell the audience that uh, I do have a website. If you want to go on my website and on the homepage, I have a list of um, videos on some of the exercises that you can that you can find. And my website is www.sarah with no H on Sarah, S A R A meeks pt as in physical therapist.com <clears throat> so sarah meeks pt.com PT. yep. is the website and my current best it's gone it's changed back again uh email we know is, we know <laughs> is j harrison two at earthlink.net that seems to work the best i did have a little problem with it previously, but it's uh, that it's working now. So it's J and then the name Harrison. That's my husband's last name, Harrison. And then the number two at earthlink.net. Now that so you make, sure, Harrison, make sure you get the number two. Harrison has two R's? Yes. 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 We'll put it down in the information below too. But uh, Okay, fine. That, I think that always helps to start off that way. So um, you want to make an opening statement on medications and uh, some things on exercise and movement programs too. So I'll let you take the floor, Sarah, okay. and begin. All right, yes. Um, I'm getting a lot of emails from the people who are watching the first two podcasts. And uh, I get a lot of questions on medication. And I just want to make a statement at the beginning that I'm a physical therapist and I'm focusing on movement of exercise. However, when it comes to medications, what I usually tell people is if you're thinking of taking medication for bone health, I would encourage you to do some research and some homework on this and find out what is available, what the benefits might be, and, and what the risks might be, what the side effects might be. Because once you make the decision to go on a medication, you may be on that medication as one person put it. And um, uh, this was a, phys uh, a physician who, who gave a webinar that if you go on certain medications, you may be on there until the end of your life. And, I thought that was kind of a long time. So that is a long time. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully a long time. <laughs> Hopefully a long time. Yeah. So I just want people to be educated. And there is information on the National Osteoporosis Foundation website and probably on other websites. 
about the medications themselves. So sure. I kind of leave, I like, I, I will answer some, some um, general questions. And I should tell you that uh, the emails that I'm getting from the first two podcasts, people do mention when they have been on medication and they're really not very happy about it. They don't get sure. good results. And so then they, they make the decision themselves just to go off the medication. And I'm not so sure that's safe either. But right. so I just want you to know that. I think that's so always that's so about, I think that's always so helpful when other people chime in and you know yeah. and provide their experiences. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the other thing is um, I also get questions on other programs um, that have been designed for the management of osteoporosis and what I think of them. Um, I stay away from that. I've spent 37 years focusing on my program for the management of osteoporosis. I think I have a good one. I've had very good results with my patients. Uh, my program has not been, uh, uh, does not have a, a scientific research study that's been done upon it. And I'm looking uh, for people that might be interested in doing that. <clears throat> However, I'm still doing it and I'm having good success with people. Even when I do uh, Zoom consultations, people seem to follow up and be able to follow with some of the things that I give them. Sure. And then I do my best to find a therapist that's within driving distance of them that they can uh, that they can go to. Uh, some of them, interestingly enough, come from quite a way just to see me. And um, I try to keep that limited now because um, I'm doing other things. And maybe I can announce this too. I'm going to probably be starting filming the videos that I'm right. going to be making. Uh, it looks like everything is coming together. Uh, possibly I might start a few of them, uh, at the end of next week, but it'll, but it'll definitely be the week after that if I don't get it by next Friday. That's very exciting. We're very yes, much looking it is. forward to those. Yes, it yeah. is. So that's about what I'd like to say as a starter. So now it's your turn. Sure. Now, now, the other programs you're talking about that you don't want to comment on, those are basically exercise programs too? Well, yes. A lot yeah, of, okay. yes. Okay, yes. gotcha, gotcha. Yes. Okay. All right, let's go. Uh, um, you have said that according to the public uh, who respond to your podcast, uh, that doctors are telling them that the DEXA score, D-E-X-A score, is related to fracture <laughs> risk. Uh, you disagree with that. You want to expand on that? Uh, yes, I would. Um, I'd like to explain what the DEXA score is. A DEXA scan is a test for bone density. Bone density is the amount of bone in a certain area as in a vertebral body. And it represents whether the paper, patient has the diagnosis of osteoporosis, osteopenia, or normal bone. Now, it's a measurement Sarah, of a, Sarah, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you, but vertebral body is uh, the bone that makes up the back. I just yes. want to make sure people don't. Yes. So that, that's yes. Uh, for those that, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, expound on that here. Sure. That uh, the spine itself is made up of, I believe, 22 vertebrae from the sacrum and all the way up to the base of the skull and on the front of the backbone uh, you have the vertebral bodies and that is where most of the fractures occur uh, in the vertebral bodies if they, gotcha. if they occur in the spine so that the DEXA scan looks at the amount of material that is within that bone gotcha. and that's called the bone density. Um, it looks, the DEXA scan looks only at the vertebrae in the lower spine, in the lower back called the lumbar spine. And so it doesn't tell us anything about what's going on in the upper back between the shoulder blades. 
called the thoracic spine, and that's where most fractures occur. Sure. So we really don't have a good reading with a DEXA scan of fracture risk. Um, so the uh, in addition even... to that, in addition to that, bone strength is what we're after. And this is related to bone density and as it turns out to eight other elements within the bone. So and fracture risk is related to bone strength and bone quality, which is represented by these by these elements within the bone. So I'm going to list what the elements are. So the, uh, the elements are the mineralization of bone. Our bones contain calcium and phosphorus and um, other uh, mineralizations. And sure. I'm not sure how they test for that. Uh, this is new material to me, so I don't really understand all of it fully. Um, but one of the exercise forms that is shown in the research to add to good mineralization of the bone is swimming, Fun. Water, nice. water exercise, even though that does not affect yeah. bone density. Yeah, there's no weight bearing. Apparently, it affects the mineralization of wow. the bone. So, yes, and that's been shown in the research. Um, also, the collagen, there's collagen within the vertebral body. The collagen properties to, uh, also uh, affect bone quality. The, the, the osteocyte density, an osteocyte is a bone cell, a basic cell uh, of bone. And the, the density of apparently when the bone begins to form or begins to grow, the density of that is also important. The geometry of the bone, basically the size of the bone will, will make a difference in uh, bone quality, the shape of the bone. Um, in, in normal spines, the, the uh, vertebral bodies seem to be very symmetrical, very much the same. They'll be a different size. They're smaller in the neck and larger in the lower back. They sort of get larger as you go down the spine, but that's an important one. Then there is the architecture of the bone, the way the bone is put together. And they look at, uh, there's a test called the TBS, which is trabecular bone score. So that is the, uh, trabecular structure are, it's like this maze of bones within the bone. Um, and there are vertical structures and horizontal structures. And the strength of them is dependent upon bone growth in childhood. Uh, so that we want our kids out and playing and moving and sure. so on. And of course, that's a problem these days. But also I found out the cortical architecture is important, which I hadn't heard before. So the bones are con um, consist of what's called trabecular bone, the inner surface of bone, the inner part of the bone, and the cortical bone is the outer surface, the stronger bone, gotcha. the tougher bone. That also has an architecture that they can, uh, I guess that they can look at. And that's an important element is, to bone it, quality. Sarah, can you look at that with the TBS test also, or are you I unsure? don't, no. I don't, I haven't not heard that. The TBS is a, an addition to the DEXA scan machine itself, a software. Gotcha. And what it does, it scans the results of the bone density. So I am not sure how, if it looks at the cortical bone and the trabecular, I, my understanding is because it says trabecular bone score, that it's looking mostly at the trabecular structure. Sure, got it. And I imagine that there are places that offer this and there are places yes. that, don't, that don't offer it. That's correct? right. Right. That's right. So, and this is another thing that I've, I've had to tell people that I've done consults with that they're looking around, they're trying to find how to get the TBS and they can't find it. And I say, well, 
I really can't help you too much with sure. that. Um, and what you need to do is go on the internet and look up all the imaging centers you can find that would be within your driving capacity right. and then start to make phone calls because some of these centers need to know that people are asking for it. Right. So Good that point. they get, get it so that they can get the test. Um, then there is um, a... A substance called hydroxyapatite. It's a mineral substance. And depending upon its crystal size, I guess it's crystal in form and its heterogeneity, um, that is an important part also. So that there are, um, there are supplements that you can get that are advertising that they have hydroxyapatite in them. So, um, I'm not sure if you took the pills that the hydroxyapatite would actually go to your bones and your back, right. but you know. That's always uh, the question, that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I had a doctor say once, uh, he came in and gave a little talk in one of my uh, presentations. He said, how do you know when you put a pill in your mouth that it's going to go where you want it to right. go? Right, well, exactly. <laughs> you don't know. You, you don't. don't know. It will, the body will do with it whatever it's right. going to do, and that's it. Um, so also, and apparently I think heterogeneity means it's diverse. It's different. Uh, it's not just like a solid substance. It's all the same. And I, I'm not exactly sure about that either, but, uh, and these are things I only discovered this paper about two weeks ago, and I haven't really had a chance to look sure. into all the elements of it. And then last but not least is the bone density itself or the quantity of the bone. So that makes up the ninth. Uh, so when you realize all of that, you know, how can you say that fracture risk would be related to just one of them? Right. It's really the, the whole bone makeup or the quality of the bone. And I had, the, I had people ask me questions like that very early on when I started teaching, and I had no idea about all of the elements that were in the bone. But, so this article is very helpful. But from a practical, practical, practical standpoint, you really yes. can only do the DEXA and hopefully get the TBS along with it, correct? Well, yes, or, that, would be, that would be a good place to start. The other sure. test I like is called the lateral vertebral assessment. That's a side view of the spine. And what it shows you is the, the vertebrae all the way from about the fourth thoracic down to the fourth lumbar. Gotcha. And if you have any compression occurring in the upper back, you will see that. Or if you see any change in the disc space, gotcha. uh, it's called cod fishing. When the disc space starts to change, that's when that's an early sign of impending osteoporosis in the in the spine itself. So, so those you're things talking you about, see. you're talking about an X-ray, just an X-ray from uh, the side view. No, I had mine done on the DEXA scanner. What they oh, did? Oh, you did? Yes. When you have a DEXA scan, you're lying on your back. So for the lateral vertebral assessment, um, I didn't get the TBS because it wasn't around. Sure. At that time, what the lateral assessment was, and all they did was tip the scanner over on its side, and they ran it up the side of my body. Oh, interesting. X-ray yeah, is but... a little hard to get. I did get a side view X-ray, but and I tried to get them to do the whole spine at once. Sure. But they didn't do that. They took the upper and the lower and tried to paste them together. That was kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, a little strange. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, the doctor he looked at it. I said, "Oh," he said, "I see a little compression happening in your eleventh thoracic vertebra," and I was like astounded. And so I had to look. I sure enough, I could see a little. You know, it wasn't much. Sure. It, wasn't, it wouldn't wouldn't be probably classified as a fracture. But I got busy, and uh, in my exercises, focusing on that area. And uh, on the second X-ray, it's. I've got a normal vertebra, so oh. you know you can change it if you know if you get if you get right at it, 
you know, you have sure. to get it right at it. You can't monkey start. around and think it's going to sure. happen by itself. So that's uh, probably more than you ever wanted to know about that question, but there we are. Well, let's go to the second one. Uh, okay. On the, this is on the DEXA scan. Yeah, that's right. So basically, you're trying to get, uh, there's three different results you could possibly get. Am I correct in saying this? You could have a normal DEXA scan yes. based, based upon what your peak bone mass is at age 30 to 35. You can right. have a diagnosis of, diagnosis of osteoporosis, correct? Yes. You could have a diagnosis of osteopenia. Yes. Now, I've seen this before. I know what you're talking about. A lot of people believe, oh, I've got osteopenia. I'm out of the woods. I'm okay. I'm fine. Right. Yep. But you take issue with that, correct? Yes. Yes. Well, because... Uh, and there's a research study on this. In fact, there are several research studies have shown that more fragility fractures, now these are fractures of minimal trauma, it's not an automobile accident or anything like that. People can fracture by turning over in bed, uh, reaching over a counter to get a piece of toast, getting groceries out of the car, opening a window, closing a window. I mean, just trivial everyday events can cause they're caused, called fragility fractures, sure. um, where you don't have a heavy trauma, and uh, they have been uh, they have been diagnosed with uh, patients who have been diagnosed with osteopenia and or normal bone. Now, statistically, there are more people in society with normal bone and osteopenia than there are with osteoporosis, regardless of the fact that osteoporosis is increasing. Um, however, my question is, why would people with normal and or osteopenic bone sustain fragility fractures? Exactly. But they do, but they do. And so I prefer to err on the side of caution. I treat everyone that I encounter as if they had a risk for fragility fractures because I can be fooled very easily by the testing also. And um, I think that people need to know this because they say, I mean, I've had people say to me, well, I just have a little osteopenia in my left hip or whatever. Sure. So, and they so think they're I fine. say, well, that's, that's fine, but that doesn't mean that you're out of the woods. You know, it right. doesn't mean that you couldn't possibly have a fracture. Um, so we need to get busy in strengthening the muscles around your hips so you'll reduce your risk. And uh, so I want people to understand that osteopenia and osteoporosis are basically related to loss of bone, less with osteopenia, more with osteoporosis. And I've had people with osteoporosis, pretty frail individuals in their 80s and 90s who have fallen and never fractured a hip. And I used to wonder about that until I found out about the importance of bone quality. They must have good bone quality. Right, right. So, uh, so it's more complicated than just the DEXA scan. Right. The bone so density. It, it basically, it could all relate back to what you went over in question one, all the other factors yep. that play a role. Right. Yep. So, now, well, it, it seems to need repeating because a lot of people didn't get that. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. So with uh, vertebral compression fractures, a lot of people think, well, I don't have one because I don't have any pain. Right. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, again, uh, and I keep going back and looking at sites such as the uh, National Osteoporosis Foundation and the NIH and the World Health Organization and so on, and to keep track of the statistics on silent fractures. Sure. Fractures that occur in the spine that people don't feel. And um, they, that's about 70 to 80% of the vertebral compression fractures are silent or accompanied possibly by a symptom that they wouldn't relate to a fracture. They may have a little tweak there. They may have no click in their back or something like that 
but they wouldn't necessarily go and have an x-ray to see if they had a fracture because they're not having pain. Sure. Loss, so loss of height would be an example too, possibly. Well, that, yes, that's where loss of body height comes in because if people have silent fractures, uh, depending upon how many they've had, and I've had people lose up to eight inches of body height uh, with silent fractures. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, it had to be silent fractures because right. you don't lose you don't lose eight inch eight yeah, inches. That's crazy. But she never never had a day of back to pain in her life that she could remember. Wow. Uh, somebody challenged me on that. Oh, she had to have pain. I said, Well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you her. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> contact and you, you go check with her. But you I could, you can argue with told. her. <laughs> that's what she told me. <laughs> sure. Um, so, and a lot of people, I think, in our society take back pain for granted. I mean, so many right. people have it. They go, well, I have back pain just like everybody else. Oh, wait a minute. Now, not necessarily so that you have to have it. Right. So, um, but with the fracture rate, uh, there's another condition that's called osteonecrosis. Uh, necrosis means death. So osteonecrosis is death of bone. Mm -hmm. And that's related to the silent fracture risk because when you have a fracture in the vertebra, you lose the arterial supply, the blood supply to the bone. And uh, then of course you have compression of the structures and so on. And that can lead actually, if you don't have the blood supply to the necrosis. And that can happen in the hip and it can happen in the spine and it can happen in the jaw and it can happen in other places. Sure. So, yeah. That's one of the risks with the silent gotcha. fracture. All right. So keeping, let me just, just add to that bit. Keeping track of body height is essential. And it's essential that the people, you, you individually have to do it yourself because I've been in a doctor office one time and said, well, we don't need to measure your body height because it never changes anyway. <laughs> so hard I to, said, hard so to I believe. Said, <laughs> I said, if you have a moment, I'd like to let you know what I do for a living. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I told her that and I said, no, I'd like to have my height measured. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma You're very polite down here in the South, you know. Yes, ma'am. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh exercise has been shown to be very good for bone health and you have said that many people have told you that they were told it doesn't matter what they do what type of exercise and you disagree with this and you counsel people to not self-select their own program that's right I don't know if you've been on the internet looking at exercise programs for osteoporosis, but there's a lot of stuff out there that would get people in a lot of trouble. Sure. Yeah. There are exercises that can cause fractures. Uh, they include things like flexion, forward bending of the spine, abdominal crunches, bringing your knees to your chest, straight leg raising, um, uh, exercises like that. Uh, have been shown to increase your risk of fracture by about 89%. That's a pretty high wow. percentage. Uh, uh, that was Dr. Sanaki's work. You know her. Sure, yep. yep. Uh, yeah. And so th that we need to design exercises that are safe and also therapeutic, of course, um, to improve function uh, in people. Uh, with a better body alignment and so on. So um, <clears throat> in terms of the kinds of exercises, uh, according to one of the books I have on bone health, uh, bones are strongest in compression. And that what that means is that, you know, because of the force of gravity, we're always under compression. Right. But, you know, gravity is a heavy force. We become accustomed to it, but uh, that's compression. And then when we sit, we have compression from the, the, uh, the chair that we're sitting in. So we're getting compression from both sides, which will, will affect sure. the spine. So basically the, the bones are usually, they, they say are strongest in compression, next in lengthening force, 
And um, I have this new exercise, which is a lengthening force. Can I show you it now? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Well, I usually do it standing, but you could do it sitting too. Do you know where the fontanelle is on the top of your head? The fontanelle? No, I'm that's, not sure. That's where the soft spot was when sure. you were a baby. So it's sure. on the back. Yep. It's not on the back here. It's up on top, but it's toward the back. So one of my clients that I did a consult with, she's calling it the fontanelle feather <laughs> exercise. So you take your hand and you place your hand near the back of your head, the crown of gotcha. your head, gotcha. more, gotcha. little more, oh, you got the, the, the mic on there. So the ear, earphone, so I'm not yeah. sure you can get it right there. Yeah, the way, yeah. And then what you do is you take a breath and you press your head up into your hand. So you wanna have the hand on top of your head and it lengthens the cervical spine. And I can also feel lengthening all the way down through into my lower back. So this is something you can do when you're standing or sitting. And then if you're out in public and you feel self-conscious about putting your hand on top of your head, you can just pretend you're putting your hand on top sure. of your head. You know, when I'm standing online at public supermarket, I do exercises like this quite a lot. I like this one. It's really good feedback. Yeah. It, 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 it's be, It's more than you think. And it's it, so easy. Yeah. It, right, I mean, you can exactly. do it anywhere, anytime. Right. I usually do one, you know, I take my shower and then I have a couple of breathing exercises I do and then I do this. I stand and I press my feet into the floor too, usually, and make sure that I'm in alignment and then just press in. But you have to be careful. You don't press your head, your hand into your head, but your head into your hand. Sarah, I saw a comment and they were talking about that. She goes, well, I'm fine. I've got an exercise program. I'm on a mini tramp. Do you uh -huh. have any thoughts? Uh, mini trampoline? Oh, mini trampoline. Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, well, basically, it probably isn't going to do anything for bone health. I mean, it might be fun to do, but I don't think there's anything that lets us know that that you're going to be able to go fast enough or hard enough to really affect the bones. They, there is, there, I did come across one research article. They did it on athletes, on the big trampolines, you know, the right. competitive kinds right. of things. And they did find some, uh, some uh, 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 effect on the bones there. But the many trampolines that we're talking about, one of the things that concerned me was balance. So I went on the internet to look at many trampolines, now they've all got these little nets around them, so right. you can't fall off. <laughs> so I guess, or or uh, they got I, handles. So yeah, 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 yeah. But I I think that um, in terms of if you're if you're I'm going to answer this question, but I, as long as it's come up here, uh, the research on affecting the bone growth and bone strength shows that you need to have odd impact and random kind of movement. So bouncing oh. on a trampoline does not do that. Sure. You're just, you're just bouncing, you know. So, right. uh, so if you'd like to go on the trampoline, it probably won't hurt you, but I'm not sure it's going to do anything for bone health right now. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to say it never will. Maybe something else will come up, you know, and show sure. that it does. It yeah. does. Um, so, but I wouldn't bet on it right now. Well, let's talk about another exercise. Let's talk about the clamshell exercise, very popular. A lot of uh, therapists prescribe it as an exercise for working the gluteus medius, which is a muscle right. that can help stabilize the pelvis mm -hmm. um, and, and the hip joint. You, yeah. disagree, you disagree with this. Well, the thing is, it's a, it's a little complicated answer. So let me explain what the clamshell is, if I can, because uh, a lot of people won't know. Right. Uh, you lie on your side and you bend your hips and knees. Um, I usually do about 30 degrees of bending. I don't know exactly if there's a, yeah. you know, but you want to, and you have one leg on top of the other. Right. Your legs should be together. Your feet should be together. And the traditional clamshell is what you do then is you lift, you rotate your leg 
and lift the top knee off from the bottom. Got it. So yep. essentially what you're doing is external rotation of the hip. Right. So what I have found in my patient population over the years, that most people don't need more external rotation of the hip. They need internal rotation of the hip. Uh, as we get older, especially with osteoarthritis, we lose internal rotation, the turning in of the leg rather than the turning out. Right. So I, do, I get people in this position and then I do what I call the reverse clamshell. Sure. I have them lift their foot so that they turn the hip inward and we're working on internal rotation. Gotcha. Also, I did look up Florence Kendall's book and after we had a little conversation, right. her description of the gluteus medius muscle, which has an, uh, a, well, it has a mid, mid, uh, mid part, which goes straight down the pelvis and along the hip. That part of the muscle is the primary stabilizer of the leg when we walk, when we stand on one leg. And if we have weakness, if you see somebody walking down the street and they're kind of dipping over right. the one side as they're exactly. walking, that will probably indicate they have weakness in the gluteus medius. Right. Maybe on the other side. Who knows? I don't know. It, it kind of you know mixes up there. But but so well, I I did dive deep into research looking for the function of the gluteus medius and what would be the best exercise. Conclusion of that particular. Uh, they looked at about six different exercises, uh, including the ones where you put the band around the ankles yeah, and things like that. Exactly. And the one that came out on top is the side lying leg lift. Or lying on your side with your legs straight. And then the way I teach it is I press the bottom leg down and lift the upper leg up. And I head toward the ceiling with my heel, not my toes because I want to have the leg in neutral, not right. in rotation. Right. You don't want to so have the toes pointed up. You know, that's the top exercise in, in the research. Now, there, it is true that the gluteus medius has an interior um, uh, part, and then it has the middle, and then, and then it also has the one in the back, anterior and posterior front and back. I'm trying to use language. For yeah, I was going to say. So, and, and, and I will agree that the, the front part of the gluteus medius probably assists in, I'm, I'm going to say, internal rotation and the back part in external, and that's fine, gotcha. but that's an accessory muscle. That's a synergistic muscle in any, in any movement. I'm looking for the main movement. The primary movement of the gluteus medius is to stabilize the hip. Gotcha. And it's the middle part of the gluteus. That medius. makes sense. Totally. The other thing I want to make on that to strengthen the gluteus medius, sideline leg lift is the best. Well, a lot of people have problem with balance lying on their side. So if, if you're a therapist working in a clinic uh, or a patient going into the clinic, you might be able to lie on a mat against a wall or on the floor oh, sure. against the wall. So that would cure the balance issue. And then you just slide your leg up the wall. You can also do gluteus maximus when you're lying on your back and bringing the leg out to the side, depending upon your level of strength. You might not be able to work against gravity. You might be able to work with gravity eliminated to begin the strengthening. It's a very, very important muscle in stability uh, for whatever we're doing. When we're standing, walking, whether we're just doing the dishes or whatever we're doing in the, in the house. I mean, it's important muscle. And, <clears throat> but to say that the clamshell is going to add to the stability portion and action of the gluteus medius, I think is a mistake. Gotcha. They need to do the sideline leg lift or the supine on the back uh, exercise first. And also the other thing about this uh, there's a common exercise. It's not the clamshell, but they have people put a loop of TheraBand around their ankles. Right. And then walk sideways. 
yeah. and, you know, in different ways. However, um, there's a problem with that. Well, the one thing that one of the things I remember learning very, very much in PT school was when you give resistance to a joint, you want to give resistance above the next joint below. So in this case, if you want to exercise the hip, you put the band above the knee. Above the knee, yes. Yes. Otherwise, you're stressing the knee. Yes, you are. Uh, yeah. And if you already have a knee, which a lot of my people have had total knee, knees knee surgery, right? And they have other knee injuries and 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 so on. And you don't want to stress the knee. So you give you give the the resistance above the knee. I tried when I when I heard about that exercise, I got some loops and I sure. different colors or different resistances. Yeah. I put it around my ankles and, you know, I have, I think I have good balance and I'm pretty body aware, but that was, I was like off balance. I couldn't, right. you know, that was a long lever arm, I guess. Then I said, well, you know, well, wait a minute. I should be putting this above my, I put it above my knees and I was fine. Sure. Yeah. And again, we certainly don't want to exercise. That's going to cause you to fall by yeah. any means. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking so of that's that. A, Oh, does that cover the... It does. Yes. Okay. Uh, speaking of exercises, let's talk about the latissimus pull down. So you're yeah. doing an exercise where you actually pull down. You pull and... down. Okay. Sometimes you pull down the hands are like this. And or, some, or you know, sometimes you different... go pull up. Go like this and right. like that. Now, the thing about it is the latissimus is another complicated muscle. Uh, and uh, I always thought that its primary action was shoulder extension, which that is one of its actions. But according to the new Gray's anatomy, the more important motion is internal rotation of the shoulder. Gotcha. With a latissimus. Now, there are a lot of internal rotators. There's a pec major, the pectoralis major. Yeah. Big there's muscles. the subscapularis, and there's the, and now the latissimus, you know, is a major one. So what happens in life, I'm going to back up a little bit so I can kind of demo this a little bit, is that most everything that we do is in front of us. Right. And we usually have our arms internally rotated, not externally. Turn and yes. Okay. So what I do uh, if somebody wants to do lap pull downs, the first thing I want to do is check their shoulder range of motion. Because if you do a pull down, you're exercising your muscles that pull the arm down. <laughs> so, but if you can't get the arm all the way up, you're not doing anything for that. And the easiest way to check that for anybody that's watching this podcast is to lie on the floor or on the firmest surface that you can, and just take your arm and bring it up alongside your ear and see if you can touch the back of your arm between your shoulder and your elbow to the floor or whatever sure. surface you're on. That's 180 degrees of motion. Mm -hmm. If you do it with the arm internally rotated, that's the easiest one. That's the one you're used to doing. Okay, if you can't touch the floor, I would not suggest you do lap pull downs. Sure. You need to get more motion in your shoulder because if you do the pull downs, then you're going to have less motion. We and should, Sarah, we should mention the reason you, you maybe want to do lat pull downs is it helps strengthen the back. That's yes. what you're saying, correct? But it, yes, and that's, I think that's what I also had here written here. Yeah. But it doesn't get the most important muscles in the back, which are the erector spinae, a group of muscles that run straight up the spine from your sacrum to the neck, to your head, actually. And um, those are the ones that have shown uh, the strength of those muscles reduce your risk of fracture. Gotcha. The latissimus doesn't do that. But as far as I know, um, uh, because it's not connected to the vertebrae, except right. it is connected to the pelvis. It's a long muscle. But uh, I just want to finish with the 
Sure. Uh, so, so I have people with internal rotation check out the range of motion. And then what we do, we, we'll, we'll go into a neutral position where we have the thumb up. So we're midway between internal and external. Mm -hmm. Okay. And check the range because now what we're doing is we're externally rotating the insertion of latissimus. Yes. Okay. So we get that. And then we check the range of motion in that position. And then we go into full external rotation and check the range in that position. So um, there is a therapist that does, uh, <clears throat> I got this idea from a therapist who teaches, I can't think of his name right away, but he has this mantra, rotation before flexion, rotation before flexion. And I kept thinking about that. And I had a patient having trouble getting full shoulder range. And I said, well, let's try the rotation. And it was like a magic. Oh. Change right that first day. Wow. Um, I forget his name. He teaches for motivations. Sure. Um, so basically, to increase shoulder range of motion, you first worked on the rotation of the rotation. shoulder. Yeah. And then, and then you could bring it up further. That's right. Especially if you if you take your arm about thirty degrees out to the side bend your elbow and then try to externally rotate that your subscap, subscapularis muscle. Sure. So you should have rotation, full rotation there, and then you will get more shoulder flexion. Gotcha. Which I'm gonna tell the audience right now that as you get older, if you wanna get the glass out of the cupboard, you've gotta have full <laughs> shoulder range. <laughs> That's right. Or whatever else you wanna reach. Well, so I think if you, if you strengthen the latissimus, you want you might be strengthening inter, internal rotation, which might affect your posture too. That's right. Correct. Okay. So, all right. Um, yeah, I yeah I have a little problem now. Like I say, if somebody has normal range in all three, you know they can externally sure. rotate well. See what happens is we lose external rotation as we age. And in the hips, we lose internal rotation. It's the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw studies on that. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was the first sign of osteo, uh, osteoarthritis, as you said. That's right. Yeah. 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 In fact, I, I went and had my hip checked with an orthopedic surgeon, and he, he mumbled something like that to me. About it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I said, first I already thing. know that. Yeah. <laughs> First thing I'll look at it quite often. So, all right, uh, Sarah, there's a new program called Osteo Strong. It's a series yes. of exercises that is marketed for improving osteoporosis. You have said that some of these movements are dangerous for people yes. with osteoporosis, or at least ineffective. So, can you talk about that, please? Yes, I can. Um, because I've been, I've been looking it up quite a bit. They make a lot of claims, uh, including, and I'll, well, let me explain what it is first. Um, and I'll start with an old saying, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Sure. Because with the osteo strong, I don't know if you're familiar with it, I'm but it's not. A, large, a large machine and there are four stations on it that could do four exercises. And they set the resistance to 4.2 uh, increase in your body weight. So I figured out for me, I calculated my body weight and then multiplied it by 4.2. I'd be working against 588 pounds. I thought that was a lot to work against. That seems like a lot. <laughs> seems like a lot, right? So I don't yeah. know. But anyway, that's how they calibrate the machine. And the exercises are isometric hmm. and uh, two of them, uh, one is a leg press where you lie semi supine and then you put your feet on a platform and you push against the platform. Now you're doing isometric, which means you're not moving joints, right. muscle contraction. However, uh, I'm not too sure about this with the osteostrong machine, but in leg presses, there have been lumbar fractures 
when people took put too much weight makes on sense. the machine. Makes and as sense. It, because what happens, they tend to flex the lumbar spine when they bring their knees up, and then right. if they press out, then the, the fracture can occur. Um, and sometimes I had one one fellow who was, let's see, how old was he? He was just devastated, 53. And he that's how he fractured two vertebrae in his back. And wow. then he had to come see me. Uh, but anyway, so that's one of the ones that I'm concerned about. The other one is the core strengthening. And I watched a video on this, and they were actually talking about the, uh, contracting the abdominals and assuming the fetal position to do so. Well, you know what that is. Yes, exactly. You know, that definitely would be contraindicated for people with osteoporosis. Right. Or, as it turns out, possibly with osteopenia and normal bone. Sure. There's another uh, principle that I learned from Shirley Sarman. I don't know if you yes, know Shirley. Yes, I know her or, very well that we tend to move in our area of greatest flexibility when we move. And to me, that means we do the easy side first or the easiest joint that can move, that'll what be the one to move first. So I think about golf, tennis, and bowling, where you're doing rotation of the spine in the same direction repetitively. And uh, you probably rotate in the same segments in the same order you know, unless you've had some really good coaching, uh, but that, that's what it means, that, that that's how you do it. So uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the machine, the osteostrong, if the person is doing this forward flexion, they're going to usually bend in the same areas first, right, right, the more right. flexible areas. And that's a total risk for a disc problem, a facet joint injury, a compression fracture, or who knows? You know, it's just not something that would be recommended you know, in my book. The other thing that concerns me about it, it's expensive. Sure. It's, um, oh, the other thing besides the four stations, then they also use a vibration plate called a power plate. That's been... Um, uh, let's see, by this, I think the CDC, uh, to be safe, that's been um, claimed to be safe for 30 seconds on it. Now, you can't do a whole lot in 30 seconds. No, you can't. The one that I recommend called the Meridarn is safe for eight hours on the vibration because it's a, a smaller force. Uh, so the power plate itself, I don't know if you've ever been on one, but I got on one once in a show. Uh -huh. And I, my teeth were rattling. I said, oh. I'm getting off it. Wow. I don't know if they were rattling, but you know, I was feeling sure. it. And it, right. it was not a lot of vibration. That, that's much too much force for me. Sure. So, and what you do is you, you go in once a week for 10 minutes and do this routine in each one of those stations and then the platform. I don't know if you do the vibration first and then the, I, I'm not sure. Right, about that. right. And it costs between forty and fifty dollars a session. Oh gosh! So if you for ten minutes. Wow. So if you add all that up, you might as well go go to a gym and get some good you know, right right training that that might be appropriate. Now you're not guaranteed that, but but at least might be better than the right. Than that. You'll get so other I better. have and the thing also that concerns me, they make a lot of claims. They say that it strengthens bone, strengthens muscles, improves quickness, speed, and power, promotes better balance and agility, decreases joint pain, improves integrity of joints and ligaments, promotes mind-body connectivity. I bet it does, mind-body. I bet yeah, it sure. <laughs> does. Yeah. And then it supports alignment. So I, I have written three emails to the company to try to get some information on their research on all of that. And it's because they, they say this, right. So do they have something to back it up with? Well, they have, they found one research article and I've, I've got to go back and listen to that 
video again, uh, that was done many years ago that said something like you need four, 4.2 addition to your body weight in order to get action on the bones. Well, I don't think that that's, well, that may be this. I don't know, I haven't seen the article. And that's what they base it on. Oh but what concerns me is that I've sent them three different emails and I, ha I, I can't get any answers. Yeah. So that, and I'm just, I'm trying to be very, you know, I come in kindly and just say, right. exactly. you know, I'm a therapist. I work with people with osteoporosis. Do you have any research that you could lead me to that would back up the claims? And so far, Nobody is answering me. So maybe when they see this podcast, one of their clients will see the podcast. Sure. <laughs> I'll go back. Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, so so I have some questions about that. About that, it's like absolutely. I say, if it's it, too good to be true, it probably is. You know. Right. Right. What about yeah. we talked about the mini trampoline? Let's talk about running. Is that a good weight bearing exercise for osteoporosis? Well, it turns out it's not one of the best, like everybody thinks it is. And, right. Uh, I would think, a, yeah. Yeah, you would think it too, but yeah. uh, you want to look at the research of, um, I'm not sure what his first name is. It's a letter R, Nykander, N-I-K-A-N-D-E-R, Nykander, has done a lot of research um, on bone. And uh, <clears throat> uh, he found that what when I went back into the research recently say, and looked at it, what he seems to advocate the most is random impact, odd impact. Um, uh, and, sure. and, and also kind of switching things around. Like if you're running, you need to run backwards. You need to run sidewards. You need to go skipping. You need to, this is what I used to do when I, cause I, I was aware of the article a way long time ago. And when I was, uh, running in marathons, when we trained for marathons, that would what we would do. Uh, we would, you know, do different kinds of movements and sure. also on uh, walking on uneven surfaces. So you're not always on the asphalt or on the track or wherever it is you are, but you get on the grass, you, you know, you go on a, a dirt trail, you go, you try to vary the forces. Sure. Because um, in, in order of the most effective um, exercise was uh, the high jumpers and triple jumpers, but then came soccer and squash or handball players because they're always moving in different directions. They're sure. getting different kinds of forces on their butt. They were second best. Then gotcha. came then came power lifters. Then came runners. Then came cyclists, and on the very bottom were the swimmers. Makes sense. But now we should emphasize safety first. You, you don't yes, try to. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you absolutely. don't fall while doing this. You don't That's walk, right. walk backwards or run backwards. And fall. That's right. You know, when I, I do, I do the walking backwards. But what I do, I usually, and I see a lot of people walking on the wrong side of the road, really, for cars on busy streets. Right. So. Uh, I walk on the left side of the road, but when I go backwards, I go over to the other side so I can see the enemy coming down the road. Oh, sure, <laughs> sure. Makes sense. So, yeah, I get across. The, I go look and I go across the road. That's when I do the backwards. Yep. yep. And I'm usually, I try to get myself to an area where I live that doesn't have too much traffic. <laughs> yeah. Wise. That's very wise. It's amazing. I have found... With my osteoarthritis in my hip, I can walk backwards better than frontwards. So, so I do that first. I get it warmed up by walking backwards. That's that's very big in the Asian culture. I don't know if you know that to walk backwards. Um, you know oh. the idea. It's, it's supposed to help balance things out. Of course, you're yes. strengthening muscles you normally want to strengthen, and, and you're. It's supposed to help with knee pain. According to well, yes, because you're you're using your quadriceps more. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. All right. It's like, um, go, it's like going up and down steps. Coming yep. down is harder. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. So if you hold, if you're coming down the step, and you spend a little time on the upper leg, you'll get much more strengthening of your quadriceps muscles. Right. 
and uh, over time, hopefully it'll be easier then. That's right. So, <laughs> so uh, many exercise classes have, oh, a yes. move, have a movement that you shouldn't do if you have osteoporosis. But you, you said you've talked to people about this and when you question them, they say, well, it feels good. So why yeah. not do it? Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? What are your concerns? Well, well, the first thing that comes to me is the number of silent fractures. Sure. So if people are doing like they start out in a chair and then they bend over and touch their toes, oh, this feels so good, it stretches out my back and whatever. Well, that's a very high risk for a fracture and you might not feel it. So that's the first thing I usually, when I talk to people who are teaching, I say, well, it's, it feels good because it's what they're used to doing, but right. it doesn't mean it's safe. Right. You know, and they also, you know, that I, I found that people like to please the teacher too. You know, like, sure. so everything is fine. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of with the way I look at it, that right. we have to develop programs that in fact, I have this little thing that I do in, in my seminars and I used to get everybody to do it, that we want exercises that open up the front of the body, not ones that close it down. Right. This is, that's what we want to get. We want to get the, the spinal extensors. We want to get the gluteus maximus, the gluteus medius. Then we want to get isometric abdominals. We want to get the diaphragms. You know, we want to get those core muscles, those stability muscles. Um, in our body. So so we used to go like, yes, no. Yes. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Well, I, we always call it the hallelujah. Hallelujah. The hallelujah. Oh. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Leonard Cohen, huh? <laughs> so, uh, no, I know. No, no, I'm sorry. Okay. No. Yeah, that's a, that's a song, hallelujah. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. So uh, all the more reason, uh, Sarah, that you need to get your videos done so that we can yes. see your exercise. Yes. Oh, I'll do that one. Yeah. In the video. Yeah. Good. Uh -huh. Good. Yeah. Well, well I, look, we've I, been paint. We've been painting. I've been planning. I've got my screens. I know how. No, they're coming Monday. They're coming Monday. The screens God. coming Monday that we're going to have. And then uh, what was the other thing that we needed to have? Oh because I'm going to do one of the videos on my exercises with the, with the resistance band, TheraBand. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to use TheraBand because it's the first that I ever knew about and I know the color codes. Sure. So that's easiest for me. Makes sense. So, so I'm going to do that one and I still have to, I have to get some more TheraBand because I want to have every color there so they can see it, you know, what, what yep. I'm going to do. Yep. Very good. And um, so I should be, if everything, of course, you know how life works. Yeah, always takes longer than you think. That's right. But my, my, I'm due to get things on Monday or Tuesday, so I should be ready. Um, the, the, the place where I'm going to do the video should be ready at the end of next week. Bravo. I'm going to mention your website again. I'm going to mention your email again. So we got yes. for email, Sarah Meeks, that's S-A-R-A, -A, no H, M-E-E-K-S-P-T, as in physical therapist, dot com, correct? Okay. Yep, that's the website. Mm -hmm. And now the email, which she does respond to emails, but give her time because she gets uh, deluged with them. Uh, J. Harrison, J. H. A. R. R. I. S. O. N. Two. Number two. At what was it? Hotmail. Sorry. No, Earth. At link. at Earthlink.com. I always say Earth like the planet. <laughs> and link like a link. <laughs> yeah. So. Link.com. Yeah. yeah. What do you say? Yeah. Awesome. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for doing the uh, the triple play here and seeing okay. us for the third time. And uh, you're they're always so so popular. We have so many viewers that uh, love you, and uh, oh. so do we. So appreciate, <laughs> and uh, we'll keep in touch. And looking forward to seeing the uh, videos. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, uh, like you, like you, I understand. I I'm a little overwhelmed by the emails, but 
I really like to get them. And of course, then when I have to do this podcast, I haven't worked on emails this morning. So, right, so. right. You got <laughs> I'm prior- getting ready for this. You got priority. But I, right. but I really like, I really like um, a co- having a contact with the public. Right. Because I'm learning things. Yeah, I always did my courses were for professionals. This is totally different. But I'm learning things I didn't. I mean, I kind of guessed what was happening, but I'm finding out what's happening out there. It's very good feedback. Yeah, it is. Yes. All right. Well, have a great weekend, Sarah, and hope to talk to you you soon. You too. Yep. Bye bye.